All right, welcome back to Lighting the Void Radio Live here on the Fringe FM. We do the music shows Monday nights, unless the Monday happens to hardcore fall on a new moon, then we're going to be doing the new moon broadcast. I think the day of the eclipse. I got my shirt, Mary. Thank you. She sent me a, a shirt and a card in the mail for my birthday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's beautiful. And I uh, also want to thank um, Michael and uh, Samuel uh, for donating and uh, Zoe for grabbing a shirt. You guys send those pictures in, man. I love showing those slideshows. If you get it like a shirt or something. We got socks and posters and we'll be putting more stuff up in the store too. Um, it's because of you guys that this broadcast can happen live, that we can do what we can do, that we can have the Fringe FM and all this stuff. So you really are the creators of this broadcast. Okay. So this is going to be, this book, I found a, a, uh, a version of it where I kind of kind of flip through so I'm going to try to read it without the glasses on uh, and then I may have to put them on because the last read I did with that one I was trying to get through it so fast that I messed up a lot of stuff so this is Manly P. Hall's what the ancient wisdom expects of its disciples and here he, I'm skipping the preface and it says a warning to esotericists he says great is the number of present day religious movements both heterodox and orthodox few of them inspire their followers to serve their fellow men along practical and intelligent lines one by one uh, various cults are being involved in materialism and commercialism among which by necessity they have been established this is not to be wondered at for it is difficult to separate our religion from our daily lives we may call it by many different names but it still reflects the thoughts and moral character, moral character of those who forms its organizations. You know, Manly talks a lot against materialism, if you notice that. Modern attitudes on life are not healthy, and organizations built up by unhealthy people cannot be normal. Commercialism has attacked every plane of society. It has entered into all the walks of life. Our race is money mad. It is insane on the subject of personal gain. Rock on, Manly P. Hall. It will give nothing to serve others, but will give everything to gain the knowledge which will make it possible for the mediocre to become a commercial power overnight. The struggle, inseparable from the ethics of competition, is largely responsible for this condition. Graft has appeared in almost every walk of life. Nearly every existing institution is overrun by some mild form of moral dishonesty, and if every walk of life is commercialized and perverted, we cannot expect religion to escape either. History records no graft or, or prostitution equal to the grafts that today masquerade under the names of psychology and new thought. The art of duping the public has evolved from the disreputable buffoonery of the Middle Ages to the polished Phariseeism of the 20th century. Now, he wrote this a while back, so it's even worse now, Manly. As seagulls follow a ship, so this curse has followed in the wake of the great wave of selfishness and moral perversion, which is the product of our commercial age. When correctly understood and properly used for the service of humanity, psychology, metaphysics, and new thought are highly commendable, and their truths are sorely needed by ignorant humanity today. But what has happened? These names have been used to conceal all forms of mental, moral, spiritual, and physical infamy until everything we know of them today is a prostitution and commercialization of the truths for which they once stood. Their success is based upon the assumption that the people with whom they work are too ignorant to realize the injury that is being done. God, he says, he says this stuff that we say so much better, doesn't he? We are not attacking the principles underlying these cults and philosophies, nor the true thing for which the names stand. Neither are we attacking those sincere people who seek to assist others to build and unfold their characters. We are attacking perversion of truth and those persons who, shielding their crimes under the cloak of wisdom, deliberately and consciously mislead the public for the aggrandizement of self. Mm, God, I... I wish I could read that again. In the 14th chapter of St. John, the 30th verse, Jesus states, Hereafter I will, not, I will not talk much with you, 
For the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The ancient wisdom is not of this world. It belongs to an entirely different sphere. It is not interested in improving the material condition of the individual from the standpoint of placing him in executive positions or surrounding him with opulence. The ancient wisdom seeks to build the character of man, knowing that if he can be made right with himself, far more is accomplished than when he is made a ruler over men. Truth expresses the synthesis of the divine wisdom. Truth is the eternal reality of things. Psychology and metaphysics as taught today are not true, and the things taught under the guise of truth are no better than those who, dis who disseminate them. An intellectual fact is not necessarily a truth. The misapplication of it is a falsehood. Yeah, so someone can tell you a partial truth that is true, or a really interesting fact, and then throw their lie in there, or apply it in the wrong way. If an individual wishes to take a course in business efficiency at the expense of others, if he wishes to attend a night school class in order to learn how to become a moral pickpocket, he is privileged to do so as long as he's willing to accept the karmic consequences. You will remember that when Lucifer decided to rebel against God, the deity allowed him to do so. It is not demoralizing to a community for people to believe uh, that God, I have to flip the page on this one, either gives or authorizes classes in slick salesmanship, shrewd bargaining and mortgage foreclosing, or that he advocates sitting in the silence to get rid of an undesired marriage partner. Modern psychology has made God appear to be as dishonest as the person who promulgate these doctrines. All this has a destructive effect on the life and health of the race. Let us consider a new point toward which the ancient wisdom was adamant and modern religion is lax. We can pick them from things going on around us all the time without going into abstractions. <coughs> uh, all right. One, in all things involving the acquirement of knowledge, the ancient wisdom says, firstly, purify your own life. This means literally what it says. Until selfishness is removed from the soul of a student, he can never hope to gain any knowledge that will serve him for any purpose more lofty than a mental stimulant. The modern psychological cults overlook this entirely, failing to emphasize any virtue essential for the human nature outside of endless desires for things not normally attainable. Once men died for the truth, but now truth dies at the hands of men. Dude, that's perfect. Number two, the apostles who died for their faith, the Christians who sang in the arena while the lions were turned loose upon them, or who hung coated with tar as living torches in Nero's gardens, these furnished vivid demonstrations of the sincerity, humility, honesty and devotion of the early followers of Christ. The master himself was led up into the mountains by the demons and tempted by a vision of the city stretched out in the plains below. The ancient initiates were tempted by the things of this world. Buddha, standing beside the crib in which lay his infant son, chose between all things which life held dear and the wandering life of an ascetic. But the great need of humanity filled his soul and he sacrificed all to his great unselfish love. Again and again, students are tempted by the voice of the world, and only if they are strong will they gain that wisdom which they seek. The true occultist wants nothing but wisdom. When Solomon raised his hands to God, Jehovah spoke from the heavens asking him what he would have, and he answered, God give me the gift of wisdom. Jehovah asked him if there were not other things that he desired, but Solomon answered, no, only wisdom. And God told Solomon that because he had asked for only wisdom, that all of the things should be added unto him, and that from this day to the end of the world, there would never be another king so rich, so great, and so blessed. There are facts well worthy of consideration in the light of modern psychology. Well, we all know what happened to Solomon in the end, because he, the, the, he gave into his fleshly desires, and you know how that happens. Not saying that... I'm not saying sex is bad, but we, I'm just saying there's a moral to that whole story. He's like one of the greatest magicians. But remember, it is a story. As we listen to the words of the modern exponents of things divine, we see, we see them making converts by offering to the ignorant the very thing by which the ancient masters were tempted by the demons of the air. 
Again and again, the new cult leader promises his disciples the city of the plains. His credulous followers fall over each other to study at his feet and learn how, through magnetic personalities or mental gymnastics, they can acquire the earthly possessions which he promises them. It's YouTube now. Not just YouTube, but think about when he wrote this so long ago. Imagine what he'd say if, if Manly P. Hall was just doom scrolling on the internet and looking at all these influencers. <laughs> the crime does not lie in desiring the things of this world, for to a certain degree they are both necessary and good. Man would not be placed in his present environment unless he were expected to study and benefit by his experiences. The great crime lies in claiming these perverted doctrines to be spiritually inspired and representing God's chief desire to be making people financially independent. Number three, compare the initiates of days gone by fighting a people who could not understand, struggling with idolatry and superstition and seeking to mold out of these things a truer and nobler concept of life, wandering day after day over the blistering sands like Moses in the wilderness, compare those masterminds with the self-term masterminds of today, and then ask yourself if you should follow them. The human race has never desired that which was best for it. But like a child, it reaches out into its hands and cries for the moon. Today the race does not know what is good for it, and individuals, instead of seeking to unfold their constitutions, their constitutions symmetrically, have gone mad over a system of philosophical hocus-pocus which promises something for nothing and exchanges divine wisdom for a moderate fee. Without labor, there is no inspiration, and none can do our work for us but ourselves. The ancient wisdom demanded many years of purification and preparation before the adepts were willing to instruct in even the simplest things. Many modern occultists are ghibli teaching Pythagorean mathematics, you guys know anybody teaching that? That's kind of cool. And numerology. And if you come every afternoon for a week, you'll be greatly amazed at how little you will discover. They wonder why it is that many of the keys of the Pythagorean mysteries have been lost to the world. The answer is simple. Pythagoras never instructed his disciples in any of his philosophical concepts until after they had passed through five years of the strictest discipline, among other things, one provision being that during the entire time they were not to speak a word in order that afterwards they might know how to hold their tongues. We would have much less trouble if our psychologists refrained from speaking for the first five years, for most of them are preaching with no more foundation for their eloquence than two weeks study with someone no better informed than themselves. There's another class. This is number five. This isn't what the whole book. He's just, I think he's letting off some steam, old manly. There is another class of people who go about discussing the infinite with ease and fluency, who as yet have never acquainted themselves with the finite. A most interesting rule of the ancient wisdom is that none of its initiates discuss the absolute. They explain the hypothesis of first cause, but state finally that no human being themselves included no sufficient concerning it no sufficient concerning it to give an intelligent opinion or definition, and no wise man presumes to discuss that about which he knows nothing. When Buddha was asked concerning the absolute, he declined to discuss the subject. He was also silent concerning the gods, feeling that they were beyond the range of human intelligence. And as a result, it has been said that he was an atheist, or at least a pantheist, when in reality, it was his respect and reverence for deity that led him, and his sublime wisdom to refrain from giving utterance to words whose very inadequacy would but defile. When the disciple of Socrates questioned him concerning the Absolute, he also refused to discuss it, stating that it was beyond his wisdom, and that it played no practical part in everyday life. But again and again, fools dash in where angels fear to tread. And while the greatest minds ever evolved by the human race dare not speak for fear, they will desecrate that which is too sacred for words. Some person, with neither record or accomplishment, nor prospect of anything better, seeks to impress the uninformed by glibly discussing things he knows nothing about. Number six. There is only one series of true occult exercises in the world, namely esoteric exercises. 
Every nation has adopted these exercises with certain modifications to meet the need of race, color, and organic qualities. The Christians took theirs from the Jews, the Jews from the Egyptians, and the Egyptians from the Brahmins, and so on ad infinitum. When Buddha gave his faith to India, he merely gave a doctrine for the consideration of the common people. For being a Brahmin himself, he followed the Brahmin culture of esoteric exercises. The so-called occult exercises are those formulas given by word of mouth by the initiates to their disciples under the pledge of absolute secrecy. In order that these disciples may use the exercises in spiritualizing, etherizing, and purifying their bodies. That's what it was for, purification. One of the most reprehensible crimes perpetuated today is the teaching by present-day occultists of crazy, homicidal, and suicidal practices under the guise of esoteric instructions. If followed persistently, these practices will result in the death of those who attempt to follow them. The redeeming feature is that the average Western mind is incapable of concentrating long enough to consistent and consistently enough upon anything to be seriously harmed. All the esoteric instructions in the hands of unqualified people today are the result of treason and broken vows among the lower degrees of initiates. In order to receive them from such sources, the recipient must become a party to the crime. And not only this, but when the student permits himself to listen to instructions gained falsely, he nullifies any good, any good which he might otherwise gain. And no, we're not just talking about, that's not talking about tarot or breathing exercises. It's not what he's talking about there. Having obtained the instructions without the necessary preparation and apprenticeship ordered by the great school, he cannot receive the spiritual insight that he desires. And it breaks the hearts of the masters to see people who know better dabbling with so-called esoteric exercising, exercises, gathering in circles to go into the silence, rolling their eyes into the tops of their heads and sitting in darkened rooms, hoping to see something. <clears throat> I don't think, I don't think manly likes seances, does he? Is that what he's talking about? It is not the mere fact that the student does these things, which hurts the teachers. It is the fact that the disciples have grown so little in discrimination that it is possible for them to become parties to such absurdities. We do not mean that they will not see things or hear voices or gain certain mediumistic powers. We mean that they will be less useful after they have secured those powers than before, for they will have to unlearn again all those things and habits which they learned unwisely. Number seven. The masters are ever waiting to entrust their disciples and students who show desire to receive with that wisdom which the world so sadly needs. If the, if the student desires to go forth and teach, he will be given a work to do. That is, if he will honestly, sincerely, and intelligently prepare himself for his labors. The reason why so many false doctrines are being taught is that people who have an idea do not ask themselves, is this theory which I have true? Am I living the sort of life that would permit me to receive real truth into my soul? Am I unselfish, open, obedient, humble, and consecrated? Have I developed my mind so that it can think? Have I opened my heart so that it can feel? If I have not, then the thing which I have received is, is distorted by the glass through which it shines. And all I can give the world is a distorted image, a dishonest representation of truth. Have I actually consecrated my life and all that I am unselfishly and without reservation? Or am I only an intellectual dabbler? Am I a success or failure in life? Am I surrounded by friends or by enemies of my own making? Am I respected by my own community? Do I allow other people to live their own lives or am I trying to force my beliefs upon all that with whom I come in contact? Have I, or have I not consciously, and beyond all possibility of mental exaggeration, received personal instruction from the inner schools? I, and I alone, know that. The rest of the world, except the enlightened few, must believe what I say. If I have not received such instructions, am I... Is, what did he say? The rest of the world, except the enlightened few, must believe what I say. If I have not received such instructions, am I big enough to admit and say with respect to my doctrines that they are only my own opinions or my 
palming off these opinions as cosmic truths upon no firmer ground than the fact that I believe them. All these questions the student must ask himself, for he alone can answer them, but he is capable of injuring many if he is not honest in his statement concerning these fundamental truths. If every teacher and student would thus interrogate himself, endless sorrow could be avoided. For he would realize that as an evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit, neither can a sin-filled body nor a perverted mind be the channel for the transmission of wisdom. Like begets like, and the eccentric individual thinks eccentric thoughts, while the sane mind views all things sanely. Number 8. Psychologists today teach how one person may influence another to do things otherwise foreign to his nature. Man, I watched a video on that today and I started getting pissed actually. It was more like relationship stuff. This dude had like a whole whiteboard of how to manipulate women, right? And his whole, like he had this whole whiteboard and he was teaching like, oh, there was like 3,000 dudes watching this thing, you know? And he was like, look, I know you don't want to hear this, but all you have to do is just constantly make her feel like she's not good enough. The moment you make her feel good enough or the moment she, that you tell her that she's the one and she's going to automatically, her biology is going to switch and think you can't do no better and she's going to become immediately unattracted. Think about that for a while for those that really want genuine love in their life. And that kind of stuff is growing and growing. Let each student of the mystery school be careful, therefore, when he studies with psychologists, that the psychologist does not turn the tables on him. If he teaches you how to gain some advantage over another and twist that individual to your own ends, take care that he does not discover your gullibility and capitalize on you by the way of demonstrating the application of his own philosophy. These things work both ways, and if you expect to psychologize others, you must expect to be psychologized in turn. For it is a poor rule that does not work both ways. It is, however, a good rule which most people are willing to have turned around and applied to them. Psychology has psychologized the public, and like the children of Hamlin uh, Town who followed the Pied Piper, immature minds have followed false teachings until they have disappeared into the unknown. Number nine, among the so-called students of truth, we see the fruitage of the delusions from which the world suffers. Sickly, nervous, no longer capable of solving their own problems, they sit around treating each other, waiting like spiritual macabre, macabres for something to turn up. These people were once useful, intelligent members of their community, but they are now so involved in mental absurdities that they are useless both to themselves and to society in general. And most of all, they are like gaunt scarecrows who frighten others from the paths of wisdom. Damn, Manly P. Hall. Number 10. The ancient wisdom is sane. It seeks to solve the problems with which we are surrounded today. It is spiritual and reasonable in the highest sense of the word. It is seeking to develop better men and women to meet the problems of the future generations. It is based upon the law of cause and effect. It has no patented formula, no shortcuts, but builds firmly and, sol and solidly the characters of those who unite themselves with its work. It is not led by mount mounted back teachers, mounted back teachers, but by great minds that have dedicated themselves since the beginning of the world to the promulgation of the sacred truths. It speaks with the experience of eternity, for it has led a thousand nations into the being and buried as many when they turn from its course. The nations of antiquity which still exist are the ones which have preserved its laws, and while those that have fallen are the ones that have ignored its commandments. There is no greater honor than to be called to the service of this eternal wisdom which has b been... Hold on a second. <clears throat> I'm going to have to use the glasses. Damn it! Okay, there we go. So there is no greater honor than to be called to the service of this eternal wisdom, which has, was before the beginning and which will ultimately become the visible exoteric ruling body of the planet. Hello. That's a little scary. Manly P. Hall knows who's going to be the ruling body of the planet, the great wisdom. 
And through the doors of its temple, man passes from the temporal to the eternal, from ignorance to wisdom. It is strong and great, this ancient wisdom. It is the earth moistened with the waters of life in which are planted the seeds of doctrines, faiths, and religions. All these are dependent upon it for, it for its nourishment and growth. They blossom forth and are glorified. But the dark and mysterious soil in which they all grow is the ancient wisdom. From, the, from it they come, and to it they again will return. They are temporal, but the wisdom is eternal. Okay. Next part is the coming of the mystery schools. Since earliest times, the belief in a superior and supreme being manifesting in totality what man manifests only in part has been the common property of human creatures. The mildness, man struggling up through the muck and mire of the Paleozoic fins, beat his hairy breast with long, misshapen arms and raised his cry to an unknown god. That's kind of like Space Odyssey, right? That movie. Even the hairy anthropoids of today have created certain uh, rudiments of religious worship. Soulless but aware, they turn their half-formed faces to the sky and clasp their hands as though in prayer. No one knows whence came the spirit of worship, the great desire to express thankfulness for the mere privilege of existing. But it is old as history. The first writings are of the gods. Probably the first buildings were temples, for we are realizing more day by day that every structure in nature is a sanctuary built without the voice of workmen or the sound of hammers. It is not only a sanctuary, but also an altar. So Manley's calling things in nature altars and sanctuaries. It is, uh, it is not only the altar, but also the offering laid upon the altar. There is no voice, no people that does not bear witness to some God, some presence felt in the silence, some power seen in heaven. All human beings are divided into four general classes, but each one lives in only one part of himself, or rather, he minimizes all other portions and emphasizes this one above the rest. The lowest of these divisions is the, phys is the physical nature, and those who dwell therein are of the earth earthy they live only for the gratification of their physical natures their idea of heaven is a place where there is food feasting and little or no work they are the Bra uh, brahmanic sudras who born in chains were doomed to live and die in shackles of low organic quality the very structure of the bones and flesh prohibits fineness and texture either of the body or the soul. Their minds are only partly active, and their bodies resemble prisons more than dwelling places. They differ from the finer temperaments as, as the dray horse differs from the Arabian thoroughbred. Man, I think, hold on, let me, let me try to fix my eyes here. This sucks, man. I'm just going to zoom in on this. So they differ from the finer temperaments as the dray horse differs from the Arabian thoroughbred. And like the former, they live to labor, plodding along to a mediocre destiny. They are the laborers who must in truth earn their bread by the sweat of their brows. Give them opulence and they cannot retain it. Give them luxuries and they do not appreciate them. They are the dark earthly ones who must ever bow before intelligence. They do not love God for they cannot know him. They are like the hairy anthropoids raising their heads to unknown elements, or their hands. Right here, I think he's not really classifying. I'm just saying, he. I've read this a few times, and if you think about the four worlds of like on the tree of life, I'm wondering if he's like dividing, because he did say some people are more focused on certain elements of their nature, right? And on the tree, the earth is the lowest, right? So the second division is made up of the artisans and those who labor both with mind and hand. They are the brown men of the Indian myth. They buy, sell, and exchange. And to their basic dullness has been added a certain cunning and some intelligence. And having a mind, they control the mindless. They are the petty shopkeepers and those of a similar class who are gradually exchanging the labor of the hand for the labor of the head. And not having the mental organism, which to reason, they fill the places of worship where thinking is done for them. They are the ones who allow their clergy to decide all spiritual problems for them. 
feeling themselves incapable of assuming the onus of heavy thinking. And as a result, their ideas of eternity are rather abstract and their credulity, credulity is utilized as a commercial asset by certain types of minds who consider it legitimate to capitalize on the ignorance of others. The third class is made up of the scientists. With microscope, telescope, and other apparatus still more complex, they attack the boundary lines of the known and wage war upon the limitless chaos. Those who wage this war in the cause of science are mostly concrete thinkers who follow as far as their in instruments will lead them, and then must wait for instruments still more powerful. Most of these minds are aesthetic, or at least agnostic, that is, of course, unless they have two standards. One to last six days in the laboratory and the other to be assumed Sunday morning church. <laughs> I don't think Manley's liking religion either. The miracles of theology are incapable of chemical analysis and are consequently taken cum grano solace by the scientific word. Therefore, the controversy between science and theology is bequeathed as a legacy to have and to hold upon the helpless posterity who come into the world to inherit the debate. The fourth and the highest group embraces philosophers, musicians, and artists, all living in an abstract mental world surrounded by dreams and visions wholly unrecognizable by other types. They have reached beyond the world of academic education to the world of creative idealism, which is at present the highest function of the human mind. This world is the dwelling place of genius, of invention, and of things which lower mentalities can only accept but never analyze. Re religiously, lower mentalities can only accept but never analyze, but religiously, these minds are deistic. And so they just believe that there's a, a creator. Most of them are monotheists, believers in one God, and many of them are mystics or occultists, and although possibly not yet sufficiently advanced to recognize their doctrines, yet belong to that finer type of mind capable of piercing the veil which divides the shadow from the substance. In all human nature there is a certain expression of primitive instinct, with the desire for food which expresses the hunger of the material nature and the desire for freedom which expresses the hunger for the intellectual nature is also found that appreciation for the unknown, that aspiration which bears witness to the slumbering germ of a spiritual nature which somewhere in the constitution of all things lies dormantly and apparently lifeless. As soon as man was capable of thought his mind turned upon himself. He sought to find a solution to the mystery of his own existence, which his unfolding intelligence was, was revealing to him in greater fullness every day. What am I? Why am I here? What lies beyond the horizon line of futurity? These were the great problems which confronted the primitive man, and these are also the great problems which confront the men and women of today. Religions have gradually been evolved as man sought to explain himself. Once they were few and simple, now they are many and complicated. This in itself shows the ever unfolding faculty range of the human mind. The primitive man could count only up to the n number of his own fingers. And since then, however, the human mind has conceived mathematics and by this science can now deal in infinite computations of numbers with at least some degree of intelligence. The greatest proof of the evolution of the human mind is found in the development of man's handiwork. The hollowed log of the primitive savage has become the great steamship of today. And this great development which has gradually been brought about through the ages is not the result of the miraculous transformation of natural substances, but the ever increase in the senses and functions. I'm sorry, but the ever gradual growth of the human mind, which is molding all its contacts into ever more complicated forms as the result of its ever increasing senses and functions. Religion is the outgrowth of many ages of spiritual hunger. When the soul of the primitive man finding itself insufficient turned in awe to the Im immensity of nature and those endless pageantries that saw a power far greater than itself. The savage turned to the, wind and and the winds and found them in something superior to himself. He trembled in fear at the voice of thunder, fell prostrate in terror as a great storm swept through the primitive world and volcanic craters belched forth red-hot stones and ashes. He offered sacrifice to the gods of the air that they should spare him. He cried from the tops of the mountains and offered incense to the stars. He could not find God anywhere. 
so offered, so offered sacrifice to him everywhere. He saw his crops burn for the lack of water, his children sicken about him. His hopes were dashed to the ground by an unknown, unnamed thing, which though he could not understand, was the determining factor in every thought and action of his life. This was undoubtedly the origin of religion as man knows it. We remember the words of the Pope, Lo, the poor Indian whose untutored mind sees God in clouds or hears him in the wind. Man is small, nature is great. Man is finite, nature is infinite. Man struggling against, against nature is like a tiny boat buffeted by the waves. In the endless grinding wheels of nature, ancient man recognized power. He realized that there was something greater than himself, a power that was supreme. He longed to exercise it and thought millions of years and through millions of years struggled like uh, Hawatha and the Maze King to extract from unknown power the secret of its greatness. Like Isis, he conjured Ra to tell his name and sought again and again to raise the veils of the, wor to raise the, veils of the world virgin. He found that some things which he did destroyed him while others brought him happiness and peace. He sought to learn which was which and why, realizing his very existence depended upon the wisdom of his choice. Remember what we all used to talk about? That's our biggest power is our choice and the effects that ripple out from there. Finding at last that he could not master nature by force, he sought to master it through obedience. Our religious codes are largely the outcome of primitive experiments as the human mind struggling for survival gradually learned the will of nature and molded itself into that will. Today, we are privileged to look back upon the history of the race and profit by the experience of the, age, of the ages. Saints, sages, and saviors, unnumbered, have lived and died grappling with the problem of human destiny. The fruitage of their labors is preserved to us in the scriptures and philosophies of all nations. What are the so-called sacred books? Are they not merely the contributions to the knowledge of the world made by those who, devoting their lives to the problems of humanity and learning to solve them, have wandered alone yet unafraid in those casual worlds, casual worlds, which man calls nature, 40 days and 40 nights in the desert kind of thing. Gradually, man has built the body or institution he calls religion. It is a mental temple. Its dome upheld by a number of columns, and each of these columns one of the faiths of men. The east, the west, the north, and the south have contributed either to the strength or the beauty of that structure. The entire building, however, is a material thing. It is the offering of man to the unknown. And as the spirit enters the human body when the embryo reaches a certain degree of unfoldment, so will the spirit of truth enter to the religious body when the structure has adequately prepared itself for such a coming. The world knows many religions, but nature has but one truth. All so-called faiths and doctrines are, co are contributing to the knowledge of that one truth. All are expressing one ideal through a multitude of tongues. There is a Babel on the earth, but there is only one voice in the heavens. All faiths are seeking to answer one question. What is the purpose of existence? And each answers it differently. When all are gathered together in their diversities, truth is established. For truth is the sum of all things, and reality is all things unto all men. The ancient wisdom is the invisible spiritual side of religion which quickens the body of religion. It is the one spirit which speaks through a multitude of tongues. It is that presence which enters in men. Uh, sorry, it is that presence which enters and when its temple has been built by the body of its workmen. It vivifies the body of faith, making it alive and not merely a series of empty shells. Like the gods of India, it has many arms and many heads, but only one heart. In the very early period of human differentiation, man was incapable of self-government, but was ruled by those appointed by nature to preserve him and unfold him to the point when he would be capable of taking care of himself. We are told that when our solar system began, its labors, spirits of wise beings from other solar systems came to us. Listen to this. 
We are told that when our solar system began its labors, spirits of wise beings from other solar systems came to us and taught us the ways of wisdom that we might have the birthright of knowledge which God gives to all its cre uh, creations. It was these minds which are said to have founded the mystery schools of the ancient wisdom, for this wisdom was the knowledge of the will of nature for her children. The greatest art in all the world is the art of being natural, for that which is natural shall survive. For ages religion has founded upon a false hypothesis. It has sought to fill the world with miracles and unnatural things. It has sought to dictate and dogmatize. And for this reason, it is failing. Religion is a body, but today it is a soulless body. It has not built its tabernacle according to the law. <clears throat> it is not serving intelligently and honestly the needs of the human race, but rather is involving itself and its members in endless dissensions of creed, doctrines, and codes, forgetting entirely the spirit of truth. And as a result, one of the most important elements of human life is gradually removing itself from the world and, for lack of an honest, intelligent, fair-minded, and progressive religion, we have an age of extreme materialism when the God of man merely changes from a gilded figure of an unknown God to a gilded coin with distinctly practical uses. The ancient wisdom tells us that there is but one religion, and that its seed was planted in the souls of things, with the beginning of the world. It became a mighty tree with its roots in heaven and its branches on earth, like the sacred banyan of India. As all the branches, as all the branches depend upon one trunk, so all faiths and religions depend upon one source, one light, for all they have been, are, and ever shall be. As some branches are large and strong, while others are small and weak, but through all of them courses one life. That life is light, and that light is the life of men. The ancient wisdom knows neither heathen nor Christian nor pagan. It recognizes only many branches on one tree, and each branch in itself incomplete, but each part of the tree of faith. The tree asks nothing of the branches, other than that they shall be true to the tree and bear true witness for the life coursing through the tree. The ancient wisdom is the life in the tree of faith. We do not see the life. We see only the leaves and branches which bear witness to the life. But in due season, the miracle of the tree is accomplished. The life of the tree is glorified in the bud and in the flower. The life of the tree is consummated in the fruit of the tree. And the glory of the life of that tree is in the new seed which bears full witness to the creative power of all that has gone before. This tree is indeed a tree of life. For without the higher and finer sentiments man does not live, he merely exists. And if any branch of that tree does not bear fruit, the master tells us that it shall be cut off and cast into the fire. It is the duty of all living things to produce some truly constructive labor as recognition of the divine life which is within them. God is most glorified when his children glorify his spirit within themselves. <clears throat> Glory. God is most glorified when his children glorify his spirit within themselves. In the remote past, the gods walked with men, and while the instructors from the invisible planes of nature were still laboring with the infant humanity of this past, they chose from among the sons of men the wisest and the truest. These they labored with, preparing them to carry on the work of the gods after the spiritual hierarchies themselves had withdrawn into the invisible worlds. Hello. With these specially ordained and illumined sons, they left the keys of their great wisdom, which was the knowledge of good and evil. They ordained these anointed and appointed ones to be priests or mediators between themselves, the gods, and that of humanity, which had not yet developed the eye or the eyes, which permitted them to gaze into the face of truth and live. Overshadowed by the divine prerogative, these illumined ones found what we know now as the ancient mysteries. These were schools of religious truths 
religion being here used in a sense of implying divine wisdom. To these spiritual universities were admitted the most worthy and most capable of the sons of men. And at first these schools were publicly recognized. Great temples were built to house the priests and serve as chambers of initiation. The record of the mystical arcane was in the form of carvings, baked clay tablets, and papyri rolls. Generation after generation was illumined by the wisdom secreted in these sacred repositories. Gradually, a separation took place among the schools of the mysteries, and the zeal of the priests to spread their doctrines in many cases apparently exceeded their intelligence. And as a result, many were allowed to enter the temples before they had really prepared themselves for the wisdom they were about to receive. The result was these untutored minds, slowly gaining positions of authority, became at last incapable of maintaining the institution because they were unable to contact the spiritual powers behind the material enterprise. So the mystery schools vanished. The spiritual hierarchy served through all generations by a limited number of true and devoted followers withdrew from the world. While the colossal material organizations, having no longer any contact with their divine source, wandered in circles, daily becoming more involved in the rituals and symbols which they had lost the power of interpreting. An interesting and concrete example of the deterioration of the mystery schools and their rituals is found in the children's Punch and Judy play. For hundreds of years, the frivolous of all Western nations have laughed at the strange antics of these little figures. The world has long forgotten that this play originated among the early Christian mystics, where Punch was Pontius Pilate and Judy was Judas Iscariot. The little club which Punch carries is a degeneration of the ancient scepters which were carried by Roman dignitaries in the Holy Land. It is also quite probable that the famous scene between Punch and the baby is taken from the early Christian story of the slaughter of the innocents. <clears throat> it is really remarkable how down through the ages by word of mouth, by allegory and symbol, and by natural example, the truths revealed to the ancients have been perpetuated to our own day, and yet have ever been concealed from the eyes of the profane. It, is, has, it has been said that wisdom lies not in seeing things, but in seeing through things. For the occultist, at least, this is doubly, uh, doubly true. That's right. You gotta see it through, through it. This book I'm reading is brown. That's why I'm having struggling with it a little bit. It's got a brown background. During the Atlantean periods of which Plato dreamed, the work of gathering and arranging the ancient wisdom went on apace. For the people of Atlantis were the greatest exponents, concrete thought the world has ever known or exponents, however you want to say it. The Atlanteans never fully understood the wisdom that was theirs. For in those early times, the gods had withdrawn from the mass of humanity and spoke to man only through appointed priests and oracles. The method of communication used by the spiritual powers is faithfully set out by Josephus in his description of the Ark of the Covenant and the priest who served it. This Ark was an oracle, and the gods spoke to the high priest by means of the language of symbolism. From the Atlanteans, with their ancient tabernacle mysteries, we have secured nearly all that we know concerning the ancient wisdom and its mysteries. According to the sacred book, they were the keepers of the spiritual records which had been given to them by their progenitors, the serpent kings, who reigned over the earth. It was these serpent kings who founded the mystery schools which later appeared as the Egyptian and Brahmin mysteries and other forms of ancient occultism. The serpent was their symbol. For they taught man the use of the creative energy which courses through nature and his own bodies as a serpentine line of force. They were the true sons of light, and from them have descended a long line of adepts and initiates, duly tried and proven according to the law. These have kept alight the divine truths through many generations of ignorance and thoughtlessness. The later Atlantean world crumbled because it wavered from the law. It forgot that nature was the ruler of all things, and attempting to survive unnaturally, it was destroyed. Did y'all hear that, you transhumanist folk? Before its disintegration, however, 
The ancient wisdom passed into the new Aryan world. And where from the heart of the lofty Himalayas, its adepts and initiates began the process of building a new people to be the living tabernacle of the gods among men. There's a lot of crazy, like, there's a lot of crazy stuff in there. What that, just that little paragraph right there. So we know they were serpent kings. <clears throat> these were, these were priests that were, that were serpent kings using the serpent as a symbol, which we now know that the symbol for the Kundalini and among other things. And they were the ones that taught the Atlanteans, the Egyptians and all this stuff. And the Brahmins. Could have been aliens too though, right? You never know. Man has not always been a material being. Eternities ago, he was a spiritual creature of radiant and glorious powers. Gradually, he assumed the coats of skins, which we call bodies, and his radiance was darkened by the sheaths of clay. Little by little, he lost touch with his fathers, the sons of light, and began to wander in darkness. At the time when the third eye closed in man during the period of the ancient Lemurian world, the human race lost contact with its invisible teachers, and gradually even the memory of them faded out until only the myths and legends remained. Y'all listen to this. Mythology is the authentic record of those periods of transition when the diviner sparks were gradually assuming the bodies of mortality. So listen to what he's saying there. Mythology not saying it's true according to his philosophy we should question him right that he's even saying this but uh, uh mythology is actually something that's carried on from a time that we were totally different beings we weren't we didn't even have skin like this and at some point we grew into skin but we could still talk to the invisible world and all of the gods that we have in our mythologies thousands and thousands of years later come from those beings. I'm sure the stories have changed a little though. But man was never left to wander alone in ignorance. And when the ties connecting him to the unseen worlds were broken, certain methods were established whereby the will of the gods could be made known. To this end, a certain number of men and women were instructed how to bridge the chasm which then separated the gods from men. The method of establishing this communication was the greatest of all the secrets of ancient occultism. This secret has been preserved for the race, for at a later time all human beings will be able to communicate directly with the gods once more. So there you go. Are there actually secrets when people say, oh, all the secrets are out? Well, if verbal teachings have been handed down since the beginning of time, and there's really no books on them, then yeah, there are still some secrets, right? A certain number of men and women were instructed how to bridge the chasm, which then separated the gods from men. The method of establishing this communication was the greatest of all the secrets of ancient occultism. This secret has been preserved for, uh, for the race, for at a later time, all human beings will be able to communicate directly with the gods once more. During the great interval of ages, this wisdom has been perpetuated in the mystery schools, and a few chosen disciples in each generation have been given the sacred privilege of knowing the gods. This wisdom and the power and knowledge they have gained, they in turn impart to a few chosen and beloved disciples. Thus, the work is carried on. The ability of the mystery schools to communicate with the invisible worlds is the basis of their power, for all the creative hierarchies dwell in the unseen worlds. And there the disciple must go in order to consult them. The reason for this is that the human race is the only one in our scheme of things that is equipped with both a physical and a mental body. The gods, so-called, that's the first time he said so-called, have never descended into physical substance. Consequently, consequently, having no body composed of dense chemical elements, they are incapable of manifesting here. In order to communicate with them, man must therefore learn to function consciously in his own invisible bodies. When he is capable of doing this, he can communicate with spiritual beings who dwell in similar superphysical substances. Hello. Thus, while religion deals only with fancies, theorems, and beliefs, the initiates of the ancient wisdom go straight into the fountainhead of wisdom, and learning the will of the gods make that will the law of their lives. 
The initiates do not guess, wonder, or so soliloquize. He labors with facts, for he is one with the truths of nature. The secret path of spiritual illumination is the way which the planetary Logos has established that his children might learn to know of him and accomplish his ends. The Logos is surrounded by a hierarchy of superhuman beings and also by a group of great initiates who may be called the fruitage of the human world period. These great initiates, with their divinely inspired minds, are established as mighty pillars in the house of their God. They are the supporters of the temple of human progress. These great minds were called by the ancient Jewish mystics, the cedars of Lebanon. These are the trees which Solomon is supposed to have cut from the forests of earth to use as the mainstays of his divine temple. From north, east, south, and west, the secret truths of these initiated minds have been gathered. The adepts and mystics of all nations have given to their disciples the fruitage of their investigations while functioning in the invisible worlds. The mystery schools, fulfilling the ancient law, are fashioned in the pattern of nature. He just told you where the actual mystery schools are. Not, they're not really buildings. The mystery schools, fulfilling the ancient law, are fashioned in the pattern of nature, and we know them today as the seven great schools of the mysteries. All these are branches of one tree, which grows in the center of the garden of the Lord, and watered by the four rivers, the wisdom of the four worlds. I got a little video on those worlds. As every ray of light breaks into seven colors when it strikes a prism, so this ancient truth striking the prismatic body of the material world appears in a septenary body. This body is called the seven-headed serpent, for although it speaks with seven mouths, it has but one brain, one life, one origin. The priests of the mysteries were symbolized as a serpent, sometimes called hydra, and from this word we have secured our common word, hydrant. And as the hydrant carries water, so the hydra body of the initiates pass the waters of life, and he is therefore a tube or a channel through which they are disseminated like water from the nozzle of a hydrant. These seven schools, each composed of twelve initiates and their disciples surrounding a thirteenth exalted brother, are the God-ordained perpetuators of the ancient wisdom as it has come from the dawn of the world when the gods descended from the nebula of the sun and took up their dwelling place on the sacred island at the North Polar Cap. Now, is he speaking in metaphors there, or is that really literal? The seven schools, each composed of twelve initiates and their disciples surrounding a thirteenth exalted brother, are the God-ordained perpetuators of the ancient wisdom as it has come from the dawn of the world, when the gods descended from the nebula of the sun, the nebula of the sun, and took up their dwelling place on the sacred island at the North Polar Cap. Mm -hmm. At this document is not intended as this document is not intended for propaganda purposes. We shall not name any of these schools, but they represent the seven planets and the seven great paths. They represent also the seven vital organs of the human body and the seven vials which pour out their contents upon the world. All disciples seeking to gain knowledge concerning the laws of nature must secure that wisdom through one of these seven channels appointed by the infinite. Appointed by the infinite. Did I miss a line here? This reading is getting tough here. Hold on. Yeah, by the infinite for further of his peculiar work. So every one of these mystery schools is invisible and unknown. They can only be found after long searching and repeated disappointment. This is why I tell people when people say, oh, man, these people came out and recruited me, man, to join their little secret society and they're running the world. It's like this, this whole thing's been set up since the beginning of time that you're not going to find it without really digging and seeking it yourself. 
They can only be found after long searching and repeated disappointment. And recognition of the dignity of these schools and the sanctity of the wisdom which they represent, this treatise has been prepared to give in a simple way some of the marvelous truths for which they stand. Every hundred years the voice of the great school is heard, and into the world comes one to bear witness to the unseen. He speaks with the voice of wisdom, and he is overshadowed by seven lights. Gradually the mystery school, the seven branches considered as one unit, is leavening the entire loaf of human thought. And today as never before men are turning to search for their gods, or we should say that they are rather turning away in disgust from our age of materiality, which is slowly crushing the beauty and spirituality out of life. Our materiality is destroying the souls of men. It is breaking the heart of the world. Amen to that. It is stifling the finer side of every nature, and something within man is revolting against this unnatural oppression. Many who have never given it thought before are now wondering what the end of it will be, how far the human race can involve itself without bringing the entire structure of modern ethics crashing down in ruins. Within the last 50 years, thousands have become spiritual pilgrims and taken up their search for truth, seeking amid the hills and the valleys of the human soul for the answer to the riddle of destiny. They are seeking for those mystic masters of, of wisdom known to legend, but of whom history bears no record. Throughout all the searching, there is a great uncertainty, but one or two facts stand out very clearly. First, the majority of people do not know what they are looking for. If they should meet the truth, they would not recognize it. The masters they seek are about them every day. But like Sir Lonful, they journey into distant lands seeking for those things which are upon their own doorsteps. Secondly, they would not accept wisdom if they should find it. They would all be glad to have the power that the masters have, but few would labor unselfishly and untiringly for the ages to secure that power and then consecrate it unreservedly, unreservedly to the good of humanity. Think about that. Why are they keeping all this stuff secret? Listen, would you? They would all be glad to have that power. Everybody wants power. They would all be glad to have the power that the masters have, but few would labor unselfishly and untringingly for ages to secure that power. And then Take that power and consecrate it unreservedly to the good of humanity. Kind of reminds you of the story of Jesus, right? Before passing on to our next subject, let us sum up a few points to be remembered concerning the great work and its workers in the world. Number one, the instinct of reverence for the unknown is implanted in all human life. It seems that even many of the higher animals must have it. For as they sit at the feet of their beloved masters, their animal souls speak through upturned eyes filled with love and tenderness. The love of the dog for its master and the love of the disciple for his teacher are very closely allied. The dog asks for nothing but kind words and will lay down his life for its master. Such is true devotion. From the savage upward reverence and devotion to the gods form part of a moral code of all humanity. Many may deny it, but in the form of either faith, fear, or superstition, it persists. Number two, the maker of the great plan which we call life, the being from which we have been differentiated, has given man certain potentialities. These, when awakened to dynamic powers, will give to each the faculties whereby he may know that plan. And by learning it himself and applying his wisdom, he may be the, he may then reach the position where he can assist others to harmonize their lives with the same law. Number three, for the purpose of disseminating this wisdom wisely among all the nations of the earth, the schools of the ancient mysteries have been established, not only by the will of man, but by the gods themselves laboring through the channels chosen from the most highly evolved children of earth. Number four, having established these schools, listen to this, this gets weird. You got to really make up your own mind. Think about this. Have established these schools, the superior intelligences, intelligences became the central 
invisible powers of these schools and are still in actual communication with the adepts and masters who at present time manipulate the destinies of these secret orders. So here's the 33rd degree Freemason right here. What does he mean by this when he says it? Is it totally literal? Listen, having established these schools, the superior intelligence, intelligences, I don't know why I can't speak today, became the central invisible powers of these schools and are still, still in actual communication with the adepts and masters who at present time manipulate the destinies of these secret orders. Number five, all growth spiritually must take place through one of the seven channels appointed by nature for that purpose. And at some stage in his spiritual growth, each disciple will enter the planetary path best fitted to evolve the qualities that lie dormant within himself. Number six, the seven schools together with their branches in all parts of the earth constitute the great white lodge. This is the divine institution appointed to give the ancient wisdom to our planet. It is composed of all of the initiates and adepts of the white path and forms the invisible government of earth. Number seven, the ancient wisdom contains the true and accurate knowledge of the plan whereby the gods, man and the universe were established, are being maintained and will later be dissolved into eternity. It is the knowledge of all things in their relation to God, nature, and themselves, and it is, and it is the only guide by which man can be shown the path he must follow if he would liberate himself from the ignorance and darkness of materiality. See, it's kind of funny how people say that Masons are they're evil, and yet, like the mystic Masons, especially like Manly P. Hall, I mean, you can definitely tell what he thinks about materiality and power and selfishness and what that's all about anyone may walk the path who will accept and live up to the obligations which the ancient wisdom places upon all whom would learn the mysteries of life and death if they will live the life which it points out they shall know not only the doctrine which it preaches but also the great ones who have been chosen by their own virtues to teach their yo younger brethren the ancient wisdom The second chapter is the mystery schools, but it looks like we're Galactic Alliance. That's what's up, right? It's really called the Galactic Alliance, right, Brian? Uh, I might, let me see. I might, I hate to stop. Don't, you know why I don't want to stop? I don't want to keep going, but I, I could take a break and keep reading. That's up to you guys, but like. I don't want to stop because if I do and then I put this up as like an audio book later, I got to edit a bunch of stuff and I don't want to do that. <laughs> the, the less editing, the better. Let's see. Let me pay. There's only 50 pages in this thing. I'm already on page 25. Yeah, look, I got to go to the boys room. I'm going to finish this thing tonight. I don't want to edit this thing. Right? Y'all with me? It don't matter. You don't have to stay and listen, but I'm I'm doing this specifically because I don't want to edit it later. <laughs> That's sad, isn't it? All right. I'll be right back.
All right, so. Damn, I hope. Man, we, we've gotten a lot. Um, we've gotten a lot more. Not a whole lot, but a little more support this month. We are this close to being able to turn the app back on. And uh, some of those like service announcements that you guys hear, just so you guys know uh, what that is. Uh, we have to play so many of those every hour to keep the music licensing on the station so we can play what we want. But there's another tier that if we got uh, enough, then I'm going to have a meeting this week and talk to everybody about this. But if we got enough support, we could cut those off, right? Because we want to do more like fun breaks and stuff, you know. We still want to support our partners and stuff like uh, Just BS Me and uh, Centropics and Mary Ducina and all that. But like those damn <laughs> PSA ads are terrible, man. They suck. They're just like boring. I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. So there's a, another tier that we can get to where we can turn those off. But we're trying. And that's what I wanted to say to... Uh, let me see. Let me see if I can just give some quick shout outs and we'll get back in the book here. Uh, so Samuel, Zoe, and Zoe got a shirt. Samuel sent in a donation. Um, Edward did. Thanks, Edward. Thanks, brother. He even used PayPal. I know he hates PayPal. Thank you. Um, let's see who else I'm missing here, man. A lot of people donated this month. I just don't have it up. Uh, even if, like, even the little ones help. Little ones, big ones, whatever, man. And if you, if you want to support this show too, uh, other than like, if you just like, I can't imagine the difference right now, but there probably will be a difference in the future. But right now there isn't. But we do have a Patreon where I'm going to be doing some stuff there every month, and I've got some downloads. You can get tarot readings there too. But I do a really old traditional style. Key Golden Dawn key spread tarot reading if you want to do that. But most of the time, even that stuff, when I get those things, like that money just goes into the station first. It always does. I'll shack up and live in a shack before the Fringe FM dies. You know that now. You know it. Um... Yeah, I thought I had this. Well, there's a bunch of, like Monica. I was going to announce everybody that donated during March, but Monica did. And um, there's a there's some names I didn't even recognize. I'll pull it up before the show's up. No, I want to do this now, man, because I don't thank you guys enough. I really don't. Give me just a second. I got to do this. I'm going to log into the back end of the website because most of like most of the time. Um, you can just see it when it pops up and it has the name, the person's name. And I don't really say anybody's last name and you can put in anonymous if you don't want your name being said or whatever, but we should do something for you guys, man. Like a, a donor thing. I need help. Jess, you're going to have to help me with that. All right, here we go. Here we go. I'm getting the list up. Here we go. So Edward, Casper, Georgiana, Brandy, Monica, Dragon Rose, Janice, Henry. Did I say Henry already? Um, and Leah, Leha. Yeah. And if I missed anybody, I'm sorry. The you guys might have uh, Michael for sure. Michael most definitely and we love you guys so much we're getting we're getting there getting back to where i used to be getting close okay let's get back in so so far man like he said some crazy stuff hasn't he paypal will only take twenty five hundred dollars from you if they don't it's scary man like uh, uh, edward even called me about that i talked to him on the phone and he's like man i he goes i don't really want to donate through paypal and he has his reasons right like i get it because of some of the stuff that happened 
but we're kind of we're kind of limited to uh PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, stuff like that. And then you know how corporations work. They got these bigger corporations that run bigger corporations. So anyways, watch a few people leave. Oh, he's talking about donations. I'm leaving. <laughs> Bye. I'm never going to stop that talking about donations. All right. So here we go. But just think about some of the stuff that he said, though, right? So he totally admitted that there's a secret, secrets, verbally handed down secrets that people still don't know about. That part where he said, having established these schools, the superior intelligence, intelligences became the central invisible powers of these schools and are still in actual communication with the adepts and masters who at the present time manipulate the destinies of these secret orders. So what is he talking about? He's already mentioned the tree, which, which we know what, like you have to understand what he's, he's trying to teach stuff, but he's also kind of, you know, allegorizing stuff a little bit too, I think. And now some people have said in this manuscript that he's actually talking about aliens though, that came here before Atlantis and all this stuff, you know, I'm not going to go around spouting about it like. I know the truth or make some kind of phantasmal entertaining video about how it's aliens. But what he is admitting to in this book and this small manuscript is pretty, pretty good, right? Die on the, on, die on this hill. Love it. Yeah. Yeah, man. I'm a dude. I just, that's how we roll. So the mystery schools, this is the next chapter. And all the schools of the ancient wisdom, the members are divided into three general classes or groups. Every seeker after truth is one of these divisions, whether conscious of it or not. The esoteric teachings of all religions are the same. The ends to be attained are identical in every case. And the only difference between them is that each school is especially fitted to reach and work with the type of mind and body of the people among whom it is established. In other words, we may say that the mystery schools interpret truth along the, li along the lines of the familiar clothing, wisdom and symbol and allegory familiar to those who are supposed to receive it. I think what he's saying there basically is like the allegories are, are of the mysteries are clothed in symbol, whether it be through the religion you're reading, stuff you see in nature, all kinds of stuff, right? All the schools demand the same inflexible standards of consecration and virtue, teaching that each student and candidate must build his own character, unfold his own spiritual powers, and control his own lower nature before he can receive assistance from any superior source. Dude, no. Sorry, I thought I wasn't recording for a minute. When little children come into this world, they are sent to our public and private schools in order to prepare themselves intelligently for their period of activity here. While they are young and uninformed, their parents protect them, but when they reach maturity, they are expected to assume the responsibilities of life and help others as they themselves have been assisted. No one is born without responsibility. Each living thing is responsible for itself, <clears throat> and when it fails to assume its individual responsibilities, others must suffer as well as the thoughtless one. The growing children are instructed in the laws governing their environments in order that they may intelligently assist in molding the destiny of the race. So the mystery schools are instructing those children of men who desire to know the laws that govern the unseen world. These laws, although entirely unknown to the average individual, play an important part in everyday life. The mystery schools are universities where the spiritual nature is unfolded and trained and man is prepared to become an active worker in the great plan of cosmic progress. The world we live in is a world of effects. Around us, but invisible, are the worlds of causation. They are the realities, while the, invisible, while the visible, which lives through the power of the invisible, is the illusion. 
So causation is the real reality. That's all we're experiencing in reality is just the effects of causation. So no matter how deeply we study the material arts and sciences, we can never find out the real cause of anything. Science is seeking and will continue to search indefinitely for a real foundation upon which to work. <clears throat> the four great questions upon which all knowledge should be, should be based remain unanswered, and science is forced to admit that they are beyond the scope of modern mentality. What is life? What is consciousness? What is force? What is mind? None can answer, for these are invisible things, incapable of being measured or analyzed. Consequently, no material mind incapable of reason beyond the point of concrete vision will ever solve their riddle. If we step across the line which divides the true from the false, the spiritual from the material, the eternal from the temporal, we must realize that the mystery schools were established in the world so that this transition might be possible. Through the special instruction and understanding gained by membership and graduation from these institutions, man is enabled to become a citizen of two worlds, for the schools themselves are of two worlds. Their gateways are in the material world, otherwise none would know that they exist. But the temples themselves are in the spiritual substance of nature. That's the third time he said that. The actual mystery school temples are in nature. In order to reach these temples, candidates must learn to function in the so-called invisible substances. The worlds of causation are invisible only because they are beyond the range of our sense perceptions. By certain forms of culture, however, it is possible to develop these perceptions at present latent in the average individual. These senses, being more highly evolved than those we ordinarily use, are capable of studying and exploring the so-called casual worlds or causal worlds. <clears throat> As power is given to man, commensurate to his wisdom and understanding it is not safe at the present time to reveal to the world at large the methods whereby the entrance to the invisible world is possible he wrote this in 1925 by the way i think that's when it was published yeah so if this knowledge were given to selfish people unprepared for their responsibility they would be able to destroy the universe whoa listen to that if this knowledge were given to selfish people unprepared for their responsibility, they would be able to destroy the universe. Either through perversion or ignorance. In order to protect the sacred wisdom, obstacles have been placed in the way of its attainment, which only the sincere and courageous would be strong enough to overcome. Years of service, self-purification, and self-mastery must be passed through before any candidate will be admitted to the path of wisdom. <clears throat> three steps or degrees lead up to the temple door and all who climb wish to enter and all who wish to enter whatever their race or their religion must climb them there is no other legitimate way of gaining wisdom those who seek to enter the temple of the mysteries by any way other than the gate appointed by the masters the same are thieves and robbers Man is willing to spend from 10 to 15 years on his material education in order that he may surpass his other man in some pursuit. So, should he then accept to attain his spiritual wisdom in any shorter time? The position a person occupies in the mystery schools is not the result of choice, ballot, or election. It is his life and the way that he lives it that is the determining factor in all his spiritual studies. He is automatically placed upon the, past of, on the path of wisdom according to his vices and virtues. The rapidity of his advancement depends wholly upon his own merits. The sincerity, integrity, and devotion which marks his daily life. He may remain many years in one grade or pass like a comet through many grades in a few years. This depends entirely upon how sincerely and honestly he has labored and how completely he has mastered the temperament and failings which hold him back. The three divisions into which the disciples of the great work are divided are given to us out of great antiquity. They are the same divisions that we find among the priests of the tabernacle of the Jews. 
They are the same as the caste divisions of India and many others. We may consider them under three headings as, follow, as follows. The first degree is that of student. This is the lowest of the three grades of the mystery schools and is composed of persons of either sex who have accepted the masters of wisdom and their work of unfolding human consciousness as the greatest reality in life and who have. Oh, so sorry, I had to flip the page. So they've accepted it as the greatest reality in life and who have of their own free will joined themselves to the cause of human progress. This does not mean that they have sworn adherence to any individual or material organization. It means that they have sanctified their lives and dedicated their efforts to humanitarian service, which is the true path of mastery and the only road which escapes the pitfalls of egotism and commercialism. Service is a great word. It means a devotion to the needs of the masses, which is so strong, perfect, and unselfish that wealth, honors, and all things this world holds dear will be given up instantly, gladly, and without the sense of sacrifice and the service of the ideal it has espoused. The class of student includes all who think, read, study, and aspire along the lines of the ancient wisdom. In its ranks are the so-called independent occultists, various kinds of untrained psychics, mediums, psychologists, and others who have no direct connections with the teachers from any division of the great school, but who are seeking according to their own light to understand the initiates words as they have heard them or found them recorded in literature. So what he's saying there, just so <clears throat> you guys, anyways, what I think he's saying is this isn't like a entered apprentice or whatever in masonry where you learn the symbology of this thing. Basically what he's saying there is if you're already seeking truth, and if certain things that you found in your religion or literature or whatever that you've combed through have lit up your deeper search for truth and that you've actually sanctified your heart to the help of humanity by your own terms, not because they said it or someone else said it, then you're already a student and you will find your way to this place. In this group, we, all, uh, we also find many student teachers who, while not initiated into the mysteries, are seeking to assist others on the path of wisdom. Such a one was Socrates, who, while himself ignorant concerning many things, gave to the world two of its great initiates, Plato and Aristotle. The student is generally without any actual proof of the thing that he believes. Some intuitive voice within, however, tells him that the studies he is laboring with are true. He must so accept them, and the privilege of knowing the reason for the things that he does is not given to him as yet. He must obey blindly the great laws as they are revealed to him and await the pleasures of the elder brothers. During these years of spiritual darkness, he must spend his life in self-imprisonment along those lines which he normally recognizes as virtuous and true. He must consecrate himself to the labor of preparing his nature for the greater responsibilities that are to come. Over a hundred years ago, a great disciple of alchemy and magical philosophies compiled a series of suggestive rules for those who desire to become true students of wisdom. We have extracted from the writings of Francis Barrett the following thoughts. Lesson 1. Learn to cast away from thee all vile affections, and in consistency of mind let all thy dealings be free from deceit and hypocrisy. Number 2. Keep thine own and thy neighbor's secrets. Court not the favors of the rich, despise not the poor, for he who does will be poorer than the poorest. Lesson 3. Give to the needy and unfortunate what little thou can spare, for he that has but little, whatever he spares to the miserable, God shall amply reward him. Lesson 4. Be merciful to those who offend thee or who have injured thee. For what shall the man's heart be who would take heavy vengeance on a slight offense? Thou shalt forgive thy brother until seventy times seven. Lesson five. Be not hasty to condemn the actions of others, lest thou shouldst the next hour fall into the very same error. Despise scandal and tattling, and let thy words be few. Lesson six. Study day and night, and supplicate, and supplicate thy creator that he would be pleased to grant thee knowledge and understanding. 
Lesson seven, omitted as irrelevant. Lesson eight, avoid gluttony in all excess. It is very pernicious and from the devil. <clears throat> These are the things that constantly tempt man and by which he falls a prey to his spiritual adversary, for he is rendered incapable of receiving any good or divine gift. Lesson nine, covet not much gold, but learn to be satisfied with enough. For to desire more than enough is to offend the deity. These rules for spiritual, spiritual propriety are as good today as when they were first written and should be deeply considered. By all students, for all things, come to man by attraction, and if seeds of wisdom and virtue are not within himself, the gods can bestow nothing upon him. The duty of every student of the ancient wisdom is to make himself valuable to his fellow man, for when he does this, he makes himself valuable to the plan of nature. The student must always realize that he is preparing himself to become the hands and feet of wisdom, for when wisdom enters into the soul of man, the wise become its servant. The student must always bear witness to the divine urge of progress. He must train his mind, control his appetites, and make himself a well-balanced example of human growth. His intellectual pursuit should be largely along lines which will assist him in his judgment of human nature. He should study both people and things. He should not become a recluse, for if he loses touch with the world and the things of the world, he cannot efficiently serve that which he has given up. His study is to view life as a place and a time for learning, realizing that wisdom is the jewel to be extracted from material existence. He must always keep in mind that he is not studying for himself alone, but is building for the day when, his long years of preparation finished, his wisdom will be used by still greater powers to assist in those great problems which ever confront the world. Every student should seek to develop talents. He should try to make two blades of grass grow where one has grown before. He must become a creative genius, an outstanding example of intelligence in the highest sense of the word. But it should always be unselfishly. He should never become attached either to the work he is doing or to the positions that he occupies, for the master may call him to the labors at any moment. And if he can legitimately and honestly become a power in the community where he dwells, he should assume such responsibilities for they offer great opportunities for the accomplishment of the greatest good to the greatest number. Hmm. It is not, I have, I was going to say something about that, but I'll let you think about it too. What he just said there. It is not expected that a student should have a clairvoyant powers or any personal spiritual abilities. In fact, it's better that he should not lest in his unenlightened ignorance, he pervert them. Students seeking to gain various forms of medianship and psychism by occult exercises and mantras should take warning. One of the masters of wisdom has distinctly stated that all forms of phenomenalism are to be rejected by the student. He, he must build a spiritual, mental nature and not merely allow his emotional palate to be tickled by weird phenomena. No true student of any legitimate master should ever attempt to converse either with the living or the dead through mediumistic powers. Some schools have made it clear that students will forfeit their right to instruction by seeking to communicate with the departed or by indulging in similar forms of psychism. Damn, I left the door open again. The student is not expected to be a great occultist or a great mystic. Such aspirations belong only to the higher grades. It is, however, demanded by the masters of the student that he shall be simple, humble, honest and patient, struggling daily to gain mastery within the true virtue over the undesirable traits of his own nature. He is not in a position to dictate what the masters will have him do. He must accept unquestioningly the responsibilities that are given to him of the great unknown and fulfill each of them as honestly and thoroughly as lies in his power. At this period of probationship, the student is gaining mastery over the little things. Let him make sure that he is successful. Let him struggle to control that sharp tongue, the critical mind, and the abnormal viewpoints, that they shall not later bring dishonor upon the spirit of truth when it shall come to dwell within his nature. The student is cutting out a finer character from the rough ash lard that has been given him. He is struggling to improve each day just a little, asking not for power or light, 
but for strength to shape his destiny more truly to the standards of wisdom. These are the labors of the student. His worthiness to receive greater knowledge is tested by long years of ignorance, often by much suffering. And through all, he must be obedient, patient, and true, realizing that each sorrow is an opportunity. Each misfortune is a lesson in disguise, and these lessons he must learn. When his task has been done, they vanish to return no more. And when he offers himself to the master's service, the student is, flipping the page, filled with unworthy thoughts and elements. Behind him stretch many ages of thoughtlessness and crime. His higher bodies are a mass of bad karma, and he is totally unfitted for his labors. Before wisdom can be given to him, it is necessary that his evil nature be cleansed. So the masters give him the labor of purifying himself as the first test of his sincerity. All that follows depends on how that first work is accomplished. Thus his consecration often results in years of sorrow for the student, but everything in has its price in nature, and a cleansed soul is the price of wisdom, for it is only a balanced and honest nature that can honestly think or honestly analyze, and all the perversions of the past pre uh, present their bills and demand payment. A great spiritual house cleaning follows, for all these bills must be paid. No true religion teaches a student that these debts can be escaped. A man does not avoid his responsibilities by becoming spiritual. He is merely giving the privilege of paying his debts sooner. In this great truth, Christianity has been false to its founder. For Christianity as we have it today is a religion of vicarious atonements until, in referring to the spiritual status of the average Christian, one of the masters stated, quote, the pauper angels of the Christian heavens. The pauper angels of the Christian heavens. Okay, whatever. I don't get that. So if the student takes up the ancient wisdom to escape his sins, he fails before he begins. For the masters want only honest men and women in their service, and all honest people shoulder their own responsibilities. As a result of this unex un un unexpiciated unexpiciated all right I gotta focus I should have got some coffee as a result of this unexpiciated karma the path of studentship is often best with uh, beset with infirmity and suffering but these things are tests which prove the character of the candidate he will be accepted by the masters only if his character survives these misfortunes and comes through them deepened and mellowed by the experiences the student must labor year after year, waiting in patience and perfect trust until he has so far succeeded that is found worthy to receive instruction from one of the masters of their disciples. No student knows when that moment will be, nor should he desire it to be hastened. His present labor is to serve to the best of his ability, and in the hands of those wiser than himself he has entrusted his destiny and his immortal spirit and in patience he awaits their pleasure. His province is to do, theirs to judge the doing. So you remember when Jesus went around and picked up his disciples, right? He was like, uh, he would just grab them. They'd be like fishing or doing whatever, and he'd be like, hey man, it's time to go, let's go. We're going to the cosmic spaceship. <laughs> They're like, oh, me? And you know, he'd tell them, about their labor and their work. You get it, right? The second degree is that of disciple. In this grade are the accepted shellas, students of an initiate, master or guru. For them the veil is beginning to lift, and they have placed their feet firmly upon the winding path that leads to the temple of one of the seven great schools. Instead of wandering far in the search for wisdom, they gather at the feet of their appointed master and learn from him. Today in occult work there is too much wandering from one place to another, too much uncertainty in the soul of the student. Let him choose one path, and having established the integrity of the teacher and the teaching, and remain with that. One day, while the student was laboring in the vineyard of life, tired but faithful and patient with all, the master came that way and stopped to watch the student at his work. The student was singing at his toil. Each thing he did was accomplished with love and sincerity. Trust, hope, and consecration were his tools. 
He was laboring not for himself, but for his brother and his God. Accompanying every act was a prayer, a silent consecration of the work of his hands and the meditations of his heart to that great invisible thing in whom he lived and moved and had his being. The heavier the load, the greater his joy, for he was doing good. All this and other things the master saw, but the student did not see the teacher. For the sweat from the laborer's brow ran down into his eyes and blinded him. The master stepped over to the student, saying, Leave now your labors and follow me. The vineyard vanished, the dirt fell from the hands of the worker, and for a moment he dwelt in space, while before him was the shining figure of his master. He sank upon his knees at the feet of the master and kissed the hem of his robe. Again the, sp again the master spoke, You are my disciple. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You have been faithful unto a few things. Now you shall ha have power over more and greater things. Thus is the disciple chosen by his master and brought into a personal contact with the teacher. I'm thinking the astral realm. This is when it happens. His cosmic benefactor. Each master has a number of disciples, usually 12. They are his chosen sons. He becomes their father. And they leave all else and cling unto him. As our physical fathers and mothers bring us into the physical world and help us build our bodies here, so the masters give us birth into the unseen spiritual worlds and assist us to build our superphysical vehicles so that we may function there. For this, the master is both father and mother, and more, for he gives us eternal birth, eternal birth while our material parents bring us only into the illusion. The disciple does not choose his master. It is the master who calls his disciple from their various labors to follow him. None not actually and actively engaged in the vineyard of life will ever be called to the greater work. For the disciple, the day of the book learning is over, and the day of personal investigation is at hand. Hell yeah. He has been accepted, and now the spiritual world centralize upon him and help him in every possible way. We may say that the disciples are the esoteric students. They are those who, having been weighed in the balances, have been found not wanting. They have reached that point when the discerning eye of the initiate notes their sincerity, and they are accepted as beyond the liability of failure. The master, after making a personal examination of the auric bodies of his disciples, gives them individual instruction concerning the preparation through which they must go for, go before they can be admitted into the great school itself. Think about what this dude is saying, all right? So, uh, you get contacted by a master. He wants you to become one of his 12 disciples. This is men and women or whatever. I think it happens in the astral realm. What do you think? And, uh, <laughs> and then he, this is a Mason, like one of the greatest Freemasons ever known to teach in this right now. Then the, uh, the master is checking out your aura to make sure your aura is ready for you to go to the next phase. You remember those stages I was telling you all about? So you have, when you, like in, in the school of magic, right? Or hermetics, when you go into that, you invoke the four elements and you, in, you know, you start out probationally like, just cleaning your field, doing banishing and stuff, and just getting your body ready for that, your aura ready. That's basically what you're doing. Your energetic field, your psyche, all that. And then you go through each element, and you you actually call forth all the powers of that element. And it shits on you. <laughs> like, it really does. Like, it shits on you. If you haven't fixed something in your life that's involved with that element, it brings it forth. So, but you're working out karmas that like you could take several lifetimes to do. Anyways, I got an ADD. I got to get going here. All right. So it is this teacher, the beloved guru and this one alone who has the power and right to prescribe any form of occult exercises, such as meditation, consecration, consecration, concentration, breathing, chanting, 
visualizing, and so forth. Students show very poor discrimination when they allow strangers interested only from a commercial standpoint to prescribe any form of spiritual exercise for them. They prove by their ignorance that they cannot be trusted with greater responsibilities. With his clairvoyant knowledge, the master will discover the exact spiritual status of the student and instruct him accordingly, assisting him to strengthen the weak points and round out the invisible sides of his nature. The work for each disciple is absolutely individual and hence differs from that of all other disciples. In all this world, there are no two people constituted exactly alike. The physical body merely bears witness and molds itself into the pattern of the spiritual organism. Therefore, this individuality merely proves the absolute individuality of each spiritual organism. No one but a moral murderer or an unmitigated ignoramus would attempt to prescribe one medicine for all cases. Anyone who writes a book for general circulation telling an individual how to develop his spiritual sight must remember that thousands of people, no two of them alike, will read it, and many will destroy themselves in seeking to follow instructions which were not intended for them. Such an individual would thus prove conclusively that he was mentally, unf uh, mentally unfitted to receive the instructions in the beginning, or he would certainly have retained sufficient intelligence to use them more wisely. The true masters never appear in public. Dude, I'm about to get up and shut the door. Like, for real, it's going to get bad in here. Hold on. The true masters never appear in public, teaching large classes or groups concerning occult exercises, but come privately to their disciples and instruct each one individually. The ability to inform the disciple concerning the steps to be taken before his actual initiation is the result of the high degree of development reached by the adept. None who is not an adept is able to prescribe for the spiritual needs of students without assuming heavy karmic responsibilities. The disciple will probably be visited at here listen to this. The disciple will be will probably be visited at night by his teacher who will come in a superphysical body, and the student will feel certain that he is fully awake, and in a spiritual sense of the word, he is. But he will recognize the master only through superphysical vision. If he has not developed his spiritual nature by right living, right thinking, and right feeling during his probation as a student, he will be unable to recognize the master when he comes. The work of the disciple is to learn unquestioning obedience. As the child obeys its father, so must he obey his master. Once the master has proven his authority and his virtue, to disobey the master in even the slightest uh, particular is to be separated from him, possibly for the rest of his life. The student must obey unquestioningly the instructions which he receives. To deviate from it in even the slightest detail may prove fatal to himself. And his work as a disciple is to prepare his embryonic, superphysical bodies so that when he is an initiate, he may use them as vehicles of consciousness. That's intense, dude. That's intense. Give me just a second, man. I got to shut this door. I, there's like f five mosquito heads coming in. Big ones. And I'm not sleeping with them bastards. Not tonight. Mm-mm. I got to I got to shut a couple of things. I'll be right back. Fold 
I just didn't want any dead air playing, man, on the radio on the radio station. Now, like, so here's the thing out here in the shack. But when I was out here before, there was a street light outside. Okay, when I came back, that light is no longer here. And uh, <laughs> that that light's no longer here. So if that door is cracked or anything is open in here, just for a little bit, and I got all these like backlights on, everything in the freaking woods, it just comes this way. It's like, it's hell, man. All right. Let me go back to this thing. All right, the third degree. Can y'all hear me? You can hear me, right? Cool. The third degree is that of initiate. In this grade are the accepted and proven disciples who, while out of the physical body, under the direction of their teachers, have actually and consciously taken one or more initiations in the invisible temple of a true mystery school. There are no spiritual initiations given in the physical world. All the true initiations must take place in the invisible world, for that is the only place where there can be found those authorized and fitted to give them. The forms and rituals used here, the forms and rituals that we use here, are all exoteric and only symbolic of the true spiritual rituals used in the mystery temples. Today, even the spiritual or even the rituals mean very little. For in the majority of cases, the student has not only lost the meaning of the symbolic services, but he has also forgotten that they had an inner significance. As Eliphas Levi, the great transcendentalist, has well said, the tests and obligations of the mystery schools are no longer given because none are sufficiently illumined to understand their inner significance. Therefore, none are willing to go through their hardships, only to find that their ignorance will remain unenlightened. This is the great fault which mystics find with the religions in the world today. In the majority of the cases, there are pageantries of empty worlds. Well, I mean, think about it, man. Like, if it, say, and the element of earth teaches you this with the body. Like, if you want to have, like, a chiseled body, you want to look good, you can't go... You can't call up the gym teacher and be like, I accept you into my life, gym teacher. Thank you. And it's like, snap. Now, look, these abs and racks, right? It's the same thing spiritually, I think. That's what he's saying. So on the threshold between the visible and the invisible world stands the dweller, which Lord Buller Lytton has so well described in his great Rosicrucian novel, Zan and I. This sphinx like creature which each must pass on his way to the temple of light represents the lower nature of the candidate himself. And while the consciousness is within the bodies, it cannot see this demon, but when outside it gets a detached view of itself, the lower animal nature made visible through a composite astral body is seen and recognized for the first time. This specter the candidate must pass as he steps across from one world to the other. In order to accomplish this feat successfully, he must gain complete control over the forces in his own nature, which since his first differentiation from the animal consciousness, have been building the lower side of his nature. If mentally and spiritually he has mastered those elements, he is strong enough to pass unmoved and unafraid before this phantom of his own perversions and enter within strength and courage into the invisible worlds. When he is able to do this, the candidate shows that he has taken the first steps towards self-mastery. Having accomplished this and learned to control his own complex organisms, he is now ready to be given power over greater things. There are many grades of initiates, and no matter how far a seeker may pass on the pathway of understanding, there is always something more for him to accomplish. We may compare it to a man walking toward the horizon. As rapidly as he approaches it, it recedes from him. No one but the absolute itself is all wise, all powerful, all knowing, or all complete. Wisdom and ignorance are comparative terms, and not only in the material world, but in the spiritual world as well. The mere fact that he has been accepted by one of the ancient schools does not mean that the student has become all wise. It merely gives him a little more exalted view. He merely sees life with slightly broadened vision but he is still subject to the laws of nature. 
He is still subject to faults and failings. He is still capable of failure. With his initiations, the disciple gains certain occult powers that ever increase as he advances along the pathway of adeptship. And as the schools in the material world are divided into many grades, so the spiritual school and the uh, mystery temple is divided into many stages and degrees. The disciple gradually passes from one initiation to another as he becomes more efficient in the labors which the invisible world expects him to accomplish. And as he passes ever higher, he gradually increases in power, wisdom, and understanding. Not, however, until the initiate reaches a very high degree does he become independent of the bonds that curb the ordinary human being. We may say that he does not become superior to law until he becomes part of the law itself, and then he is above breaking it. Even after many initiations, all the laws of human limitation hold good. Initiates are subject to the birth, growth, and old age. Sickness and sorrow still confront them at every turn. They must return to this life again like other normal human beings until their development carries them to a state of consciousness much higher than that which they, I guess, started, or much higher than the average individual can hope to reach in one lifetime. So there he's admitting that if we went through this stuff, we, we just keep reincarnating and going back into the mysteries again, right? If you're called to it. There are no initiates who are not clairvoyant, at least to a certain degree, for they cannot receive their spiritual ordination until they are capable of functioning consciously out of the physical body. Neither are there any true initiates who do not know their true position. Many people come and say, I had a strange experience in my sleep. Was it an initiation? The answer is nearly every, in every case, is negative. The initiate is in doubt. It says the initiate is in doubt neither as to what he has accomplished nor what he has been through. The average student can ask himself, what am I here? What is he saying? If the average student can ask himself, what am I here and now? Am I worthy to be picked for greater responsibility? If I were a master with all the world to choose from, would I choose myself for great and responsible works? I'm going to say no on that one. If I would not, with my, narrow, with my narrowed sight, would the master be deceived by the slender virtues I possess and choose me when there are others much more fit? There are no adepts or masters in this world or upon the invisible planes who have not passed through all the sorrows and uncertainties of human experience. They have reached their present position because they have mastered those uncertainties and have risen above the circumstances which chain most people to the selfish side of life. All of the great ones have passed sequentially and gradually from ignorance to wisdom. None was made overnight. Each was tempted and each was strong enough the moments of temptation. All were persecuted. Many died for their ideals, preferring wisdom above all treasure and truth above all power. And each initiate who now sits in session with the elder brothers has earned his position by consecration, intelligence, and sincerity. These are the magic keys which open the gates of the mystery schools. Again and again the question is asked, how can we know an initiate if we come in contact with one? And we can only answer, by their works shall ye know them. And after analyzing the lives and habits of those initiates whom we are all able to recognize with our limited vision, we find that they all adhere to a general series of rules. Conditions are altered by the needs of the moment, but among the ancient manifestos we find hints as to the conduct of the adepts and mystics. For many hundreds of years, the true adepts and initiates shrouded themselves in an impenetrable veil of mystery. This procedure served many ends. First, it protected the initiates from the endless inconveniences to which they would be subjected by the curious and the credulous. It also permitted them to live quietly and silently, to study and pray, unknown and unsuspected, even by their next door neighbor. Then again, it multiplied the power which they had over a world which they could not oppose them because, or which could not oppose them because it could not discover them. And lastly, it enabled these schools and their disciples to escape the persecutions of religious bigotry and intolerance that have always been felt when man sought to discover God without the benefit of clergy. 
But why do you keep it a secret? That's not fair. It's not really a secret. Makes you wonder though, right? Like reading this stuff makes you wonder. It should. Like it's either one massive dominating cult or they've hidden it so well that you have to really be a good person and seek with all your heart and soul to find it. This is stressful, man. I'm going to have a smoke. This is stressful. What do you guys think? I haven't even talked to you guys all night. What do you think? Is this a, is this a, a, a cult? Is this aliens ruling the world? Is it evil? Or is he telling the truth? Do you, you get like a, even an intuitive feeling? I don't, I'm not saying that you know what's true, but do you even get an intuitive feeling that what he's saying is real? Nobody. I don't know if this is, I don't know if this chat is like, uh, delayed or whatever. No rich man may enter the kingdom of God. Right. Right. All right. Damn, man, it is late. All right, we're committed. We're committed. It can't be too many more pages. Okay, so the Egyptian Sphinx is supposed to have pointed out the initiate's code of conduct by the symbolic interpretation of four creatures comprising it or composing it. The body of the bull with its great strength was interpreted to mean the process of labor to do. The legs and the tail of the lion speak of courage and are interpreted as meaning to dare. The wings of the eagle now bespeak of loftier things, so they are interpreted as to aspire. The human head with its sealed lips means to be silent. Of all these rules, the last is the most important. So now you know the Sphinx or the four, you know, quadrants of the Zodiac. It's even in Revelation for y'all orthodoxy folk. The lion, the bull, the man, and the eagle. I think he calls it the ox in the Bible, though. No, this stuff ain't hidden in the Christian Bible. It sure is. One of the one of the ancient occult axioms was, if you know it, be silent. Today, in both the orthodox and occult worlds of religious thought, there is entirely too much talking. Well, how can I do a talk show, Manly P. Hall? How am I supposed to do this and not talk? I'm trying to do old 70s style radio here. And every time he talks about too much talking, I start to feel a little insecure because I talk a lot. <sighs> okay. There are too many cla uh, claiming powers and virtues, which they do not possess. Places of worship, worship have become institutions of debate, while cliques and clans are breaking off in all directions because idealism has been wrecked on the rocks of petty personality. There is a sure fit of initiates, but little wisdom. There is a multitude of pedagogues. What's a pedagogue? I don't know that word. There is a multitude of pedagogues and demigods, but all together cannot keep peace in their own ranks, let alone convert the Gentiles. <laughs> That's true. Even some of the mystery schools that I messed with, like the, you know, even, even masonry, man, they start getting worrying about who's, I can't wait to be worshipful master or he doesn't deserve it. And they start getting into petty crap. You know, it's stupid. Nearly all this comes from too much talking and making light of serious matters. The names of the masters have been dragged in the mud. The mystery schools have merely become part of the paraphernalia with to juggle commercial psychology and the spirit of reverence and love, which the ancient world felt for its initiates has been lost in our day because of the host of false initiates and fraudulent psychologists. A true occultist, be he student, disciple, or initiate, never discloses his position to any 
except those equally interested and equally sincere along similar lines. He should do his work incognito, veiling the truths he has learned in the simple language of the street, telling men what they should do, not what he himself is. Urging, suggesting, but never forcing either his opinions or his philosophies upon others. Neither is he puffed up by applause nor disheartened by criticism. He should labor quietly in the field where he finds himself. He should always be inconspicuous, silent, and unobtrusive. He should labor diligently, allowing his work and not his tongue to speak for him. Dad always told me, believe what you see, not what you hear. An initiate or disciple should never state his position publicly, nor should he discuss his spiritual aspirations. If he has been privileged to view spiritual phenomena in his own life, if he has been taken out of his body, I knew it. I knew I screwed this up. If he has been privileged to view spiritual phenomena in his life, if he has been taken out of his body or is developing clairvoyant powers, those are the most sacred things in his life. They should never be spoken of in public. I gotta go. The show's over. For they are sacred to him and his master. To discuss personal powers is the worst breach of etiquette to conceive etiquette conceivable in the occult world. Well, at the time, just to be perfectly honest with you, I was listening to Robert Monroe. I wasn't like aspiring to be Plato or Pythagoras, you know. But it is true, <clears throat> like, and I've talked to other people that have said this too. When they have that out-of-body experience, I'm not talking about astral travel or a lucid dream. I'm talking about that out-of-body experience. I've talked ad nauseum on this show. Yep. I've had other people tell me as soon as they start going out and telling people about it because they're so excited, it stops happening. It gets harder. More boundaries are set up. I'm just going to say, man, based on my experience with my own journey, what he just said right there is 100% true. But that's just, that's just my experience. Looking back over the lives of initiates, we know several things concerning which they were most, that were most exacting. We're sorry to find that students of today are rather lax in these things. Therefore, we suggest for your consideration the following. A. All true occultists abide by the laws of the nations and the community in which they dwell. While in many cases they recognize these laws as imperfect, they abide by them less by their moral example they should teach the less intelligent to break the restraining bonds of law and order. It is said that laws are made for those who break them, and we may add that laws were not made for initiates, but there is a very small minority of people intelligent enough to live together honestly without the assistance of law. I don't know if I believe that, Manly P. Hall. No matter how bad these laws are, they are, for, they are far superior to the lawlessness which would exist when the mental hazard of punishment is removed from the untrained and ungenerated man. And there is the kicker right there. So if you're an anarchist, which means government is okay. True anarchy means that you believe government is slavery. Okay. This is where I think this is what confuses a lot of people that when this confuses all of us, when we study this stuff. So we read books like this, that, that very ancient stuff is, is brought to light. This seems beautiful and inspiring. And it seems like we should maybe take this path, might learn something. And yet everything we see in government, especially the, the yes, sir, boys, there's so, there's so much oppression and stuff. And so these are the two clashing philosophies that are button heads right now. And I think for a good reason. So you have anarchy that is trying to, it's, it's trying to come out anti-government anarchy. And I understand why. We all do, right? And then you have people that are government, just government socialist kind of based that say, and here's what he says. What does he say here? He he says, well, it, you kind of have to have it. 
We don't want initiates to be restrained by government or law or order. Laws are only made for those unintelligent people that break them. But there's a very small minority of people that are intelligent enough. This is what the Masons believed and why they created this government to begin with. There's a very small minority of people intelligent and left to live together honestly without the assistance of law. That's another debate for another time, but I always think about that because there's a lot of stuff the anarchists teach about natural law and some of the same stuff that they've pulled from Freemasonry and lots of wisdom there, and it makes sense. But then you, kick, you sit back and you think, well, if we had anarchy, what would happen? You know, like, what have we seen that people do when they just run amok? <clears throat> and this was, well, this, so this was written in 25. I, I, I'm going to get ADD and never end this. Okay. So from time to time, occultists are dragged into court because they have failed to set a good example to their fellow creatures. There's no doubt that the element of persecution which existed in the Middle Ages is still to be found in places and that many are unjustly persecuted. Yeah. But still, there are entirely too many who, feeling that their spirituality is superior to that of their fellow creatures, deliberately ignore the law. Especially is this true with the wildly fantastic soulmate and free love institutions. These things are not sanctioned under any condition by the ancient wisdom, for the mystery schools themselves instituted the legal bond of matrimony. Anything which suggests the breaking of existing laws without first preparing a better law for the mass of the uninformed is outside the pale of the ancient wisdom. So right there, he's telling us since the beginning of time, the ancient wisdom has governed society or you know something like that true occultists break no laws regardless of how unjust they may be if they see injustice they labor to introduce more just legislation a notable example of this is found in life of in the life of abraham lincoln many times slaves came to him slaves came to him before the civil war begging him to assist him to escape from their lives of servitude and this lincoln refused to do because it was against the law. But he told them that while he would never break the existing statues, that he would consecrate his life to making a better law. It is in this spirit that all occultists must work with injustice. For in this way, truth is established without the rioting and Bolshevism of lawlessness. C. All occultists and initiates should assume the dress and customs of the nation or people among whom they dwell lest any departure from that custom shall cause them to be unduly conspicuous. This was one of the strictest rules of the ancient wisdom teachers and is found among the old manifestos of the Rosicrucian Brotherhood. I was just fixing to say that. The only, they, you know, for some reason when occultists get involved with this stuff, they start wanting to, sometimes some of them want to like, you know, get, fantastic tattoos or express themselves differently than society because they've been enlightened and all this stuff. And then that causes attention and then people want to know what's going on. And then next thing you know, the cat's out of the bag. So you have to blend into society is basically what he's saying. Blend in. The true adept and initiate shall reveal his identity to no man unless that one is worthy to receive it. The secret work which they have been permitted to have is a two-edged sword. When they have prepared themselves to receive it, it was good for them. But by promiscuously giving it to others, they could do great harm. Therefore, they reveal to no man the secret instructions that they have received nor the source from whence it came. Being satisfied to disseminate it quietly and inconspicuously. When questioned concerning these things, they state their position and then remain silent. This privilege to remain silent, they defend with their lives. C, or the E, sorry. The true initiate and disciple shall never be boisterous or declamatory of his statements, nor radical in his viewpoints, nor encourage such conditions among those with whom he comes in contact, nor speak of his organization or his masters. 
The true initiate has no will but the will of his masters. Hmm. Nor does he palm off his own judgment as having any more important origin than his own brain. He must take no radical steps unless commanded to do so by the great brothers who have the lives of men in their care. F. When dwelling in a community, initiate shall be pieced, loving, simple, kindly, charitable, and not critical of those about them, making themselves invaluable through their intelligence and their integrity. They shall watch their conduct day and night that it may in no way reflect against the exalted organization for which they bear witness. They shall be humble in all things, willing and glad to do the most menial labor if it will add to the welfare and progress of their fellow creatures. It shall be said of such a one of the Master Jesus that he went out about doing good. G. Under no conditions shall they use any of the spiritual powers which they may possess for their own aggrandizement or protection, unless such is for the unselfish good of others. It is against all the laws of occultism to apply any knowledge which is of a supernatural nature for the salvation, preservation, or improvement of self. Ooh. Well, that's not being taught today, is it? As stated of the Master Jesus, others he could help, but he himself he could not save. For this reason, modern psychology and mental magic of various kinds are contrary to the orders of the ancient wisdom. For by modern psychologists, this, or psychologists, the student is taught these spiritual gifts that he may use for his own aggrandizement. H. Under no condition is the teacher warranted in exacting pay for the spiritual instructions which he gives. For no money was paid to receive them, nor is any coin of the realm a payment for them. The student assumes his share of responsibility and ingratitude is one of the major sins of of occultism when a student who is in a position to assist retards through his uh, I guess he's saying slows down through his miserableness 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 the work of the master such a one assumes all the karmic debts incurred as the result of his failure to cooperate no student should study occultism with the object of using it as a commercial enterprise such will never see either the masters or the temple. Ever, 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 ever. <clears throat> the foregoing may throw some light on the reason why it is so difficult to determine the position of the ancient initiates. Their reticence and humble spirit have seldom found a place on the pages of history, and yet they are the real molders of the destinies of nations. They are the invisible powers behind the thrones of earth, and men are but marionettes dancing while the invisible ones pull the strings. He's actually saying that. I have no strings on me. We see the dancer, but the mastermind that does the work remains concealed by the cloak of silence. A follower of the master of any of the seven great schools, which they have established in order to disseminate the ancient wisdom, is not privileged to call himself a member of any occult order or school until he has passed one or more actual initiations in the spiritual temple of the order to which he has been drawn by his planetary lights. <clears throat> the reading of literature, the payment of fees, or the signing of pledges does not make the student an occultist or a member of any of the true spiritual orders. So what he's telling you there is, just because you're paying dues to your lodge or whatever, or organization, or because you're reading books or because you signed a pledge means that you're an actual student of an occult of the real wisdom only by the first initiation in the spiritual temple is he made a true member he may join the society or that organization or the other brotherhood and so state but he is thus affiliating himself with only an exoteric order his true membership comes with his entrance into the temple which contains the spiritual hierarchy that animates and vivifies the outer material institution. Time and time again we find students, disciples, and even initiates of the lower orders uh -oh, who through a certain remnant of egotism still remaining in their natures have brought disgrace upon the thing which they truly love. 
This usually results from some ignominious failure, which they make and which because they have incessantly emphasized their spiritual position, is laid at the door of the school, which they claim to represent. With a slight revision of scriptural phraseology, today many people say, what good can come out of occultism? This is why. This attitude is the result of the great spiritual schools being humiliated again and again by the abject failure of some of their disciples. This condition is largely the result of egotism, for the disciple was unable to stand a little dignity without making sure that everyone knew about it. Egotism is one of the most serious of human failings that the occultist has to overcome, for it makes him insensible to his own worthiness of which no true disciple should ever lose sight. In this day of religious thought, most people desire to belong to something. Like barnacles, they attach themselves to the ship of human progress, and finally, when a sufficient number of these crustaceans <laughs> have attached themselves with their hard-shelled opinions, the ship either sinks under the weight, or like some of our occult organizations, must go into dry dock and have its interest incrustations removed damn so you can tell manly p hall is trying to do some occult work here he was also a mason and then the the people join because they want to be magicians or rosicrucians or masons or have occult power or whatever then they go out and do some stupid shit and then society points at them and it's like look uh illuminati occultist crowley loving satanist So then they gotta go hide again. <laughs> I, I think I think I can see why he's frustrated. So when you claim membership in anything, ask yourself whether that institution is as proud of having you as a member as you are of claiming membership in it. Most people join spiritual movements to gain something for themselves. They become parasites, living off a tree of wisdom which another man has planted and cultivated. True people affiliate themselves with the mystery schools not to better themselves, but to serve that institution faithfully and well. Until they feel that they are a credit to it in every sense of the word, they do not wish to have their name linked with it. They don't want their name linked with that which if they are not worthy a worthy representative. So instead of claiming membership in this, or that order, or that other order, thus casting reflection upon the integrity of the masters, let us take another of the ancient rules for our standard, and in this way uphold the dignity of the superior thing. Let us suppose that you have just joined the ancient re religious order, which is called Gnosticism. That's one of them. We have said that there were three divisions, students, disciple, and initiate. Let us see how we should state our position if we were to attain any one of these three degrees in the ancient religion of the Gnostics. If a student, we would, as a student, we would say, I am a student of the Gnostic philosophy. If a disciple, we would say, I am a disciple of the Gnostic path of wisdom. If an initiate admitted into the spiritual temple of the Gnosis, we would say, I am a Gnostic. In this last simple statement, we have distinctly affiliated ourselves with the spiritual hierarchy manipulating the Gnostic order. Mm -hmm. You heard that, right? So there is a spiritual principality and power or something behind manipulating the story of Gnosis and the order so that the seekers may find it and learn higher and higher mysteries through the study of Gnosticism. And even if they become a, an, an initiate of the Gnostic order in the spiritual worlds, not this world, you're still supposed to shut up and just say, I'm a Gnostic. In this last simple statement, we have distinctly affiliated ourselves with the spiritual hierarchy, manipulating the Gnostic order. We would never say that we were anything unless actually initiated it into the esoteric organization which concealed behind the exoteric order is in every case the true institution of which the exoteric structure is but the symbol so all the books and all the gnostic temples and all of the rituals and everything you're doing in this world is simply a symbol 
You're not even actually initiated into it until that happens in the internal world. Every member of an occult organization should make his position unmistakably clear. He owes this not only to the order, but also to himself. For daily misunderstandings arise because students are not honest enough to admit to themselves to be merely seekers and not adepts in disguise. The ancient wisdom demands honesty and would have in its ranks none without sufficient love for the order to defend it from every calumny. What does that come? Calumny and bear upon their own shoulders. If necessary, it's honor and integrity. Why should people try to be virtuous when they see others pass on to wisdom with all their sins? The high standards of this wisdom schools are discredited by persons. The high standards of the wisdom schools are discredited by persons who, while full of faults, claim to be initiated members in good standing of an organization which stands for all that is high and noble. In the name of the great work, it is wise to admit that all we have of virtue we owe to the masters and their instructions. While for our vices we are indebted to our own lower natures. This attitude will serve the great work far better than you will ever know. That's it. That's the end of it. We did it. We made it. Damn. So this is like a, a, a small pamphlet. I'm thinking like he wrote this after he probably went. I don't know. I'd have to look up the history of this, but he probably became a 33 degree Freemason, probably got into alchemy a little bit. Oh, manly probably joined the Rosicrucians, maybe a magical order within the realms of all this Freemasonry and stuff. And then had all these damn experiences with nincompoops inside these societies and decided to write this pamphlet so that everybody in all these orders would read it just like, I wish he would have made more of these little pamphlets. Like, so the occult anatomy of man was one, one small pamphlet. And this one is the other one. Okay. Well, that was inspiring. Manly P. Hall sure knows how to, uh, make people shut up. But he doesn't really, though, because people aren't going to shut up. This book has been out for a long time. It's been read on the air. The first time I heard this book was by Josh Reeves, which was one of my favorite readings. But still, like, it's just, it's something, that's, you know, like, there's something that's always existed in this place that, that regardless if you think it's aliens or whatever you think all this is, that for, there's something that's always existed is people that, they have like this spiritual like narcissism about themselves like they have answers to everything you'll never hear these type of people say I don't know they just no answer they have answers to everything they know it all pisses me off pisses me off All right, so thank, thank you guys for bearing with me tonight, right? Like, uh, I just wanted to finish that so that I didn't have to do two episodes of it. We'll be back next week. I'm going to try to put out some content this week that might be related to something a little different. And um, please support the station if you can. Um, thank you guys for all that. I'm still getting happy birthdays, even though it's the fourth. Thank you. It's the fifth now. And... Um, there's always something I forget to talk about. Oh, don't forget, Anthony's audiobook is out. It's a great audiobook, you guys. Like, he did a good job. He wrote this book. And we, if you go back and listen to uh, the show, it's called The Siren. I think it's called The Siren or something like that with Anthony, Anthony Tyler. We talked about that book that he did. It's out. And here's the deal I'm going to make, you guys. If you want the book, and you promise to leave an honest and thorough review of the audiobook. Just, I have a certain amount of codes I can give out where you get the book for free. So DM me and I'll give you the code. But direct message me on whatever platform you can reach me on. Doesn't matter where. You can email me to it, producer at fringe.fm. But you got to promise me <clears throat> that when you get the free audiobook, that you'll listen to it. 
and then give an honest review. I, I don't want to give the mafia a hint of leave a good review, but I'd really, we just need some ratings on there, you know. If you don't like it, then don't leave a review. <laughs> but I think it was a great book. It was a really a fun read, man. So, hey, what's up, Night Star? I wish, I wish, um, we have to do this more, like when people, so people can call in. It feels like some kind of weird book club instead of a radio show, doesn't it? All right, love you guys. We'll see you guys next week. Night, night. Sweet dreams. Don't forget Mary's show that's coming up on the 8th. We're going to be doing, uh, so I think the eclipse is that morning and then the show is that night. Pretty cool. Y'all hang out with us in the uh, the Telegram and stuff. Hit me up this weekend. Night, night.